1947 I was born and um, it was in a, a, a part of London which you might call uh, well it's the southeast London which was a kind of working class area uh, in the sense that we were we was surrounded by small factories which actually kind of made electronics or metal work or and of course post post war these places were I suppose everybody's idea of uh, um, utopia, you know, because things were being made after all the destruction. We had a very good English teacher as well, an Irish fellow, uh, who introduced me uh, during that time to Samuel Beckett, which is, uh, I call him Samuel Beckett, my constant companion. I mean, a literary companion, which is great. You know, this, this is why I, I'm, I'm, I've almost astonished myself when I look back on the pieces I've written, uh, how many of these pieces uh, allude to ideas of Samuel Beckett, either texts or uh, his thoughts or, or particular um, examinations of the human condition, etc., etc. So, um, but the but the school thing with, uh, with the big band, uh, we, I mean, it was a, it was what you call a brass band, military band. Uh, and nobody could quite work it out, but it was a, it was mostly all sort of woodwind instruments, brass instruments, no strings or anything like that, but a few drums and stuff like that. We had our different instruments and we played accordingly. And uh, I suppose what you would say it was a very very open uh, open musical education. And and as such, we started a little jazz band, which uh, we were allowed to play on what they call open days when the parents could come to the school or sometimes they would have a, a meeting in a park or something and we would play our, our Dixieland jazz. So that's where, that's where I started learning all my bad habits because from the Dixieland jazz uh, side of things, we, we formed a quartet to play a lot of uh, um, American swing music and things like that. As young lads, we used to go to the uh, pubs and the working men's clubs, uh, drink the old pint of beer, but play a lot of standards for for the uh for the gentlemen with their pints and some will come up and sing with us as well so this is where not only did i learn where to drink beer or how to drink beer but i also learned a few standards as well which was great i mean it was very nice to play all of these things and you wouldn't get this these days but uh, a couple of the teachers were great supporters of our, our uh, endeavors and they would turn up and support us on the night as well. Say, come on, lads, yeah, you're playing well. So this is, I think, I think this type of activity, starting music uh, from almost zero. Um, I mean, I had, I, I played with my, I had, a, and my twin sister taught me the uh, desk count recorder. That was the first thing, but that was prior to school. So I had a little bit of musical knowledge, even though it wasn't really. Um, very much in the family, but uh, my, my sister took some time out and kicked, kicked my backside every so often if I didn't do the work on the on the uh, on the recorder. But it put me in good stead anyway. So uh, so all of these things, let's say all of these activities, added up to a musical education which was I would call unusual. Within the school band, um, I, actually I started on, uh, on trumpet. That was my first, uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think I chose it. I think, I, I think it was thrown at me. Say, so, you know, nobody ever wanted to play this thing, so you learn the trumpet. But, um, and then um, I tried, we were encouraged to try different instruments, you know. So I tried the clarinet, but I, I didn't feel comfortable with that. But... You know, I managed a couple of terms with it um, and then, but I stuck with the brass instruments and then uh, dropped down uh, to the valved trombone, which was great for the jazz band, you know. And uh, I, I also, um, well, this, this kind of came a bit later, but uh, I doubled on um, tea chest bass. You know, in those days you could get a tea chest and a broomstick and a single string. The, yeah. the, the washing line, which would go from yeah. the top of the stick, yeah, and which they used in sort of skiffle groups and, uh, and um, the, the simplest form of, of bass note playing. You just tensioned the, the stick, you, the note went up and you let the stick go and the note went down. 
Very good. It's a nice way. It was a good way of training the ear, I guess. And then um, I, t I went on to uh, French horn, um, or it was the military band version of it. I think it was a C horn. And, um, and then I, I did try the slide trombone, didn't have much success with that, but then the euphonium. And you might notice there's a pattern here. I'm going downwards and I'm heading, heading downwards to, uh, I think I even got to the tuba, but at that, at that point I thought, well, I'll stick with the valve trombone because it's, it's, it's nicer for my ear. But I did get my parents to buy me a double bass. So this, so this is where, this is where all the rot started. You know, I start, I, um, I actually had to learn how to play four strings on a bass and the right notes. So I used to walk around with a little piece of card, uh, cardboard under the strings telling me which notes were are there. And I would ask the guys in the band when we were playing these standards, I said, well, you know, what, what note do I play here? And they say, well, play four Gs there and then drop down to four Ds there. That's that string. So it was trial and error and very, very uh, time consuming. Uh, they were very patient with me. So, but I managed to um, develop a, a little or put together a little book of standards and chord sequences. And I, I worked hard at home. So this is where the jazz thing started. I almost went straight from school as being a draftsman with this architectural firm in Westminster, which concentrated on uh, Gothic architecture, mainly Gothic architecture. So I was having a time of my life, but you know, the music was still running a, pa a close parallel. And um, so I, I started to, I thought, well, I, perhaps I should learn a few, few things on the bass. So I started taking private lessons. Uh, also in, I was, getting fascinated in composition and uh, how pieces of music were put together, uh, other than the standards that we were playing, which are kind of regular sequences and stuff. But I, I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough to hear some, some contemporary musical pieces, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, um, um, it was uh, Zanarki's uh, Pithopracto, uh, um, oh, there was uh, the Threnody from, from the victims for Hiroshima from Penderecki. Um, so there was, there, was the, 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 there was this other musical world which was shadowing this architectural activities, you know. And gradually it became more and more intense. I went to Goldsmiths College, what we call evening classes, to study composition there, uh, which is where I found out about uh, uh, Stockhausen. And actually, I think I probably heard Beethoven for the first time there as well. Um, but, the, you know, the, let's say the, there was a broadening of the musical spectrum, which was great. In those uh, classes at the Goldsmiths College, every year, each of the um, students, part-time students or evening students, had to write a composition for the, uh, just to prove that you've actually done some work during the year, you know. So, uh, interestingly enough, my first piece then was a piece called uh, Perceptions and it was a, a piece of music which actually included most of the pe uh, most of the folks in the in the composition class that could play instruments uh, plus a few others from the outside but crucially for me what was important was that my improvisational um, adventures actually played a part in how I composed that piece. It wasn't a great piece, but the, the, what they played was fantastic. So that was, I thought, well, I've actually written a piece, you know. Yeah. And um, there were other odd occasions. Um, uh, when I was, because I was living with my parents at the time, I remember uh, getting terribly impressed by something I heard on the radio, Benjamin Britten, some, uh, some carols that he wrote uh, for Christmas time. And... Uh, I was moved to try and write something like that. I don't know why, but I just love them so much. So I, I, it was an early exercise around about the same time to do a little bit of vocal music. It was, it was rubbish, but uh, I, it was worth a try, you know. My father actually, uh, he, he didn't know very much about music, but for some reason, uh, one day he came home with uh, 
a vinyl, a 12 inch LP of, Be of late Beethoven string quartets. And, um, and I thought they were the most mysterious and odd things I'd ever heard, you know, but uh, I think he thought that as well. But um, for some reason, uh, his workplace, he used to work in the, in, the, in the city of London in working for the tea trade. And, um, but, and his bosses, I think, were a little bit music minded because they gave him two records. One was the Riverside Giants of Jazz, which um, had all the, all the well-known, well as I was to find out, all the well-known uh, modern jazz masters, which, who were still alive then, of course. And, um, and also the Beethoven String Quartet. So this was these two albums, in a way, uh, gave me a sort of a good slap around the face and, uh, that really said to me, wow, this is where music can be, out there or out there, you know, there's the improvisation and there's classic Beethoven, late Beethoven. And uh, I hadn't got the foggiest what, what was really going on there. And I suppose this is why I went to the music, the uh, evening classes to find out how Beethoven, who he was and how it worked, you know, because this was, this was a revelation in a way. In 1973, I wrote a string quartet, my third, third string quartet, which won the, what was called the Radcliffe Prize. And it was a, it was a, it was a quartet, uh, string quartet with voice. I have a note here, which I found in my diary the other day. It says, String Quartet 3, San Francisco, Kronos. And I think they came to England, and I think they... They play, made a performance of this quartet with Jane Manning as the singer. It might have been in um, oh, quite, like, quite late on in 1984 or something like that. I think this was, might have been the first time that I, uh, they had come across me and me, them. And I think they were, they were doing probably one of their big world tours and they came through England. And I, I seem to remember that, that they got together with Jane and there was a performance. But, but crucially, the, the big thing that um, I found is in, um, I've got this here, it's all very small, in the work list, there was a piece called Road to Ruin, which was, uh, 19, I wrote that in 1986, for four voices and string quartet, um, with a text from Siegfried Sassoon, who was one of the First World War poets. It was commissioned by Kronos and Electric Phoenix, which were the four voices, First performance was in 1986 uh, at Darmstadt Art Festival of Contemporary Music. Uh, and the first UK performance, uh, England performance, was 31st July 86. Uh, Dartington, uh, oh no, first UK performance was in Dartington, which is in the, in the West Country. And the first London performance was 3rd of August 86. So they, they I must say, but they were very... Um, I was very taken that they stuck with this piece because it was not easy. It was, um, I have to say that the the parts that turned up for the for the, uh, the players were not good, and I think they must have been pulling their hair out because I was incredibly embarrassed about the the way that the parts were presented. You know, having worked on this piece, I was so proud. I thought, oh, fantastic double quartet. You know. And then uh, I think po probably most of the rehearsals were, were trying to get, pull the piece together. So let's say it wasn't a, a, an auspicious start. But I think that was, the, the, that was really the last time I, I, I worked with the quartet, and, um, um, or the, in this case, the octet. But I thought what they did was extraordinary. And how they pulled it together, the commitment, the enthusiasm, and uh, I have to say, they were very patient with me. They sh perhaps they shouldn't have been, but anyway, I think I, lear I learned a lesson there. Um, well, I can only imagine that uh, um, the quartet had very good memories um, of the third quartet um, and indeed the Road to Ruin uh, octet. They might have thought, well, this guy can, even if it was, even if it was quite hard work putting it together, at least he had some knowledge of how to write for string quartets. And being a string player, I've, I've, um, string quartets 
have always interested me. I'd worked with string orchestras all my life, chamber orchestras. And um, I think I have a sort of certain sensitivity to how, to how the, the quartet or how the chamber music environment works, you know, how you work with each other, how you support each other. And, uh, and I think this is, this is very important. You know, I just realized that all, what, what is the essence of all this is the blending of the instruments and how the people work together. And this is, for me, is the, is the important uh, thing that's in my mind when I'm writing a quartet. Very often, for me, a piece starts um, with a background of either text, poetry, painting, uh, architecture. There's always something which is, is the trigger. So in, the, in, in this case, um, the, the, the quartet, I wrote, what is the word? It's, it's literature, it's, it's Samuel Beckett. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with this last poem of Beckett's. And um, I, was, I, I was so intrigued by the, uh, the structure of, of his words and, the re and how he built up the kind of repetition of words, extending sentences or small uh, ideas. And, uh, but there was, there was always a, a punctuation of what is the word. And as I've, I think I've written it, this um, Beckett's examination uh, in, towards the end of his life of the idea of language. Uh, this was like a, a meditation on language. But there was a certain, I noticed this, for, for me, there was a certain rhythm going on in the words, the way they were increasing, decreasing repetitions. And uh, I noticed there was, uh, for instance, uh, I, I did, a, um, I've just pulled a few things out here. There's, there, there's a word, for instance, that, uh, that I got terribly interested in. Um, uh, it starts with the word folly. Uh, folly, for two, for two. What is the word? Now, this, this idea is a, is a kind of a repeating thing. And what is the word turns up eight times within the text. And I thought this is this, um, this a sentiment, and it's not a question, but it's 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 a sentiment about um, viewing the landscape of, of language. I thought that this was a moment where, which could somehow invite us in uh, for a musical change. So I had, for instance, there are 12 follies, for instance. It's mentioned 12 times. And uh, there are eight times what is the word. Now, and in a way, um, I, I used the word folly as as, a, as the kind of opening into a into a rather complex glissando section. Now, what I wanted to do in this um, these various twelve follies with the glissandos following, I wanted to um, somehow thinking of the, the project for the future for young string quartets, I wanted to present the, a written version of some a complex multiple glissandi throughout the, the quartet. But I also wanted to have a version of it in a graphic form, which would invite the young players to um, ponder and even attempt a spontaneous creative way of doing almost the same thing but enter into a completely different world of improvisation. Now here is the written out quartet. This is, this, these are these intervals, these glissandi, uh, first violin, second violin, viola, cello. This is the written version of it. Here is the graphic version, uh, exactly the same shapes. This, the here and here, you can see there's all these uh, glissandi and they're, they're running in the same direction. But here I just, suggest the intervals, which are the same intervals here, but suggest the intervals. And the idea is that you kind of spontaneously go for it in performance, if you want. You can, you can refer to the, 
original to give you some semblance of, uh, of, of what I'm getting at. But I would love the thought that so as, you're, as you're playing, you suddenly you just kind of leap into the dark and play this, follow this. They're very short, they're very short sections, maybe five seconds, four seconds, three seconds. But you have to, the idea is that you have to um, be clear about what you want to do. The idea is to, is to you know, you're going, opening that door and you're in and there's no way back. Uh, until the next gesture. So I want these, I wanted these gestures to, I, I want it to be, you know, in the system rather than just reading notes. I want the, I, I, the it, you can just read the notes if you want that, which is fine. Uh, but I thought as a, as an exercise, it could be great just to let, let things fly, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, you have these huge contrasts between, you know, sort of uh, hitting it hard and these moments of introspection. So that was, this is sort of the characteristic of this piece. So uh, this is, this, in a way, this is uh, what I get from um, the, the Beckett. As I, as I said, folly, folly for two, for two. What is the word? Folly from this, all this. Folly from all this given, folly given all this seeing, folly seeing all this, this, what is the word? And you know, you get this, there's a, almost a kind of a, a rhythm coming from what is the word seeing, folly seeing, what is the word glimpse, seen to glimpse, need to seem to glimpse, folly, what is the word? And so this, this, this um, sort of, Emotional churning it was uh, quite important for me as I as I was reading the text, and and I there is just just if this is another one of those sort of uh, strange things. This is how I was putting together the types of actions that uh, the string players would indulge in the various glissandi, and it's sort of color coded here. Uh, and uh, we've got the Purcell or the as it was originally Purcell, but Humphrey fragments, we've got the fast, fast moments, we've got Glissandi, we've, and uh, you know, there are different types of articulations which I wanted to, uh, to sustain, the, uh, sustain the argument, the musical argument. So, but that all came from the, the rhythm of the words, if that makes any sense. I've uh, taken them, these little fragments from uh, a piece by uh, a composer called Pelham Humphrey, who was, uh, uh, who was around when Purcell was around. Pelham Humphrey, didn't, he, was, he died very young, I think 20, 24 or 27 or something. He was a really precocious and absolutely wonderful composer, but he didn't last long in, for some reason. But he wrote some very beautiful music. And uh, I remember this, there was a piece called, Oh Lord, My God. And uh, it, was, it was a verse anthem and uh, it was string orchestra and choir and soloists. And I, um, I played this many, many years ago with the Monteverdi Orchestra under Sir John Elliot Gardner. And it was one of those pieces that just locked into my brain um, then and then years pass and uh, for some reason and David is the person that actually uh, released this again because he's when we talked about doing this quartet he said to me um Barry you know I, I know you love um, um a, a baroque music why don't you use a little bit of Purcell or some fragments of Purcell in your in your quartet and I thought Purcell yes ah Pelham Humphrey Poof. The light bulb, you know. That, that, uh, I, so actually, what I did, I honoured his suggestion by um, opening, opening the uh, quartet with um, a little, a little gesture here, um, which, which uh, honours one of my heroes, the jazz bassist Charles Mingus, and uh, but also. It, uh, it's uh, in honor or in memory of Purcell, um, uh, the um, 
what's it called, fantasy on one note. So what happ happens at the beginning, we just have this single note, which is repeated. Now, but the Charles Mingus bit, which is uh, for me quite interesting, I love it, I loved it when I first heard him do this, um, was this thing called a buzz. Now, I'm gonna show you this. Here's the buzz, I'm just gonna grab my bass. So, here's the bass. I don't know whether you can see, that's, a, that's the bass, that's there. Now, Charles Mingus, um, did this wonderful thing in, I just remember, one of the old records and he, he pulled the string around the side of the fingerboard and, and, and played this kind of note. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful, that's very soulful, you know. So I decided to start the uh, Fantasia on one note from Purcell, but modified by Charles Mingus. And then the first folly comes in, folly. Then we hit the glissandi. But then that's always, the, after the glissandi sections, we have these moments of the Pelham Humphrey. And then what I, what I love about these, it's the, the, these are moments of introspection and the change, change of, uh, of, of thought. It's on the boundary between thoughts of, of really quite active to serenity. And this was, this is one of the, main uh, sort of structural aspects of the piece. In the string quartet, I wanted to have that, this tension in the glissandi, always tempered by these, these moments from the Pelham Humphrey fragments, which actually could put you on a different level for a moment before getting hit again, you know. I would uh, recommend anybody, uh, any musicians, uh, all musicians, to listen into improvised music, because uh, I think it's important to to understand that in improvised music that uh, people have to coexist and communicate. Right, because you have to communicate, you have to exchange, you have to listen, and I think that's uh, that's uh, in, that's uh, very important. Now, string quartet playing, for instance, it demands intense listening and I assume this uh, that's well understood you wouldn't be playing string quartet music but I would advocate a, a process of looking outside of the obvious parameters that you're involved in you know just look around and be aware of everything that's above you behind you it's you know it's ahead um, I think you I think it's very good to be flexible in your daily activities I think it, it, I think it impacts on everything we do I think one of the other thing is, which I which actually has come sort of directly from um, improvising, is uh, is is care, care for your colleagues, um, understanding uh, understanding your colleagues, and um, humility is very important. Actually, to understand what somebody else is trying to put over, you know, we t we, t we so often tend to get stuck in a in a particular direction, and we don't see what's what's on the side, what else can be uh, happening, on, uh, as I say, around us, you know. And I think if you care for your colleagues, then I think you care for the musical notes, every single musical note you make. Uh, it, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they have to be looked after. The idea of graphics and drawing is, is terribly important for me as uh, in the first instances of composition. And uh, like many composers, sometimes it's just a gesture, you know. For me, the graphic score is, is an expression of uh, structure, uh, sort of architectural principles, the, um, the, the logic of drawing, the logic of arranging um, lines in space. So they're, they're, that's all very important for me. So um, there was a, a couple of pieces I've written recently that, that, that include graphics as, as part of the, as part of the um, process, you know. The pencil's always ready and I'm ready to, so, mm -hmm. ah, that's music there tomorrow. Have patience 
and look after your colleagues and work together as a, as a group to realize the music. That's, a, uh, that's the only way it's going to be done. I, I, think, uh, I think the more care that you take with, the, with your friends and your colleagues, the more the music will live. <laughs>